We were going to start a discussion of Paul's second epistle to the Corinthians. I had three things I wanted to mention before we get into it. I said today we we're going to talk about some things that the Orthodox Church always do, and the West is just beginning to learn, especially the Protestant world is just beginning to learn, maybe over the last 50 years. But I should have said there are things that the Orthodox Church has always known that the Protestant Church still doesn't know. <laughs> but uh, for one thing, we know very well that the New Testament Scripture was edited by the Church. Mm -hmm. We've always done that. Yeah, for instance, in the Lord's Prayer, the words, For thine are the kingdom, power, and glory, don't exist in the scripture. And they were not a part of the Lord's Prayer. We know that some copyists copied that end of the gospel because he heard it in the liturgy every Sunday as a priest response. And so the priest response was put in there. That's why Orthodox Christians never say that when we say the Lord's Prayer. Mm -hmm. We never say for thine and the kingdom of God away because it's not there. And uh, it was just a copy of the take. And the last verses in uh, Matthew's Gospel are also not there. Because uh, as Apostle Paul said, we baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But at the end of Matthew's Gospel, they add the words after going to the poor and baptize, and teach all nations, baptizing them, period. And the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit were not in the original. There are also something that the priest says during the baptismal service, and the uh, scribe, some scribe, thought that should be there because he heard it when you heard it every time you had a baptismal service. And uh, so it, it copied it into the, into the gospel, but it wasn't there in the original. There are other things too that we know that were edited. And uh, the second epistle to the Corinthians, we know that it's a compilation uh, from three epistles compiled into one because they didn't have the complete epistles left anywhere, so they took the portions of the three that they hadn't combined it into Second Corinthians. So it, it really consists in three letters of Apostle Paul that have been combined into one. The other thing, uh, when people criticize on text, textual differences, or stylistic differences, you know, Paul didn't write in this style, he wrote in that style, and, well, it's not surprising because Paul dictated these letters. We know that because he says so in the letters. And the scribe he dictated to took the dictation in his own style. So the stylistic differences have to do with whether Timothy took dictation and wrote this letter, or whether Tertius took dictation and wrote the letter, or whether perhaps Luke sometimes wrote the letter. Anyway, different people took dictation from Paul. And the way they wrote down what he said had stylistic differences. So we know that uh, that's not a valid criticism. Even uh, among the prophets, the holy prophets, somebody took down what they were saying. They didn't write it themselves, Paul. So, uh, I mean, that's what scribes were for. You had scribes were very important in the day because <coughs> the, so many people couldn't write. And if you want to write something, if you want to write a letter to somebody, you know, to your aunt or your uncle, you didn't put it in a yellow basket and just give a task it off. You uh, went to a scribe, and you dictated to the scribe what you wanted to say, and sometimes the scribe would write it in his own words, or mm -hmm. it was always a hymn, of course, in those days, uh, because people could write. And you had that even in more modern times when somebody who could type would rent out their time on a typewriter to type what you wanted to write for you, and you'd pay them to do it. Now that was, in my youth, you still had people who were professional typists who would charge certain fee to type what you wanted them to type. So that's why there's stylistic differences. So we can't make any conclusions from that. 
but uh, we, we do know that, uh, for instance, Paul probably didn't, did not write the book of Hebrews, the letter of, to the Hebrews. And in the ancient church, they never thought that he did. They thought it was quite questionable that he would have written it. And somebody asked me online once, what if Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John didn't actually write the Gospels? Well, as a matter of fact, when the Gospels, all those four Gospels first appeared, they weren't accredited to anybody. Nobody signed it and said, I, Matthew, wrote this Gospel. The only one we can identify is Luke, because when he says at the beginning of Acts, his former treatise of Theopolis, if I written, he was talking about this Gospel. But we, we don't know. Uh, in fact, it may have been a hundred years before they assigned the office of the Gospels to Mark, Luke, and, and uh, to, to Mark and uh, John and uh, Matthew. But the authority for the church is not the, God, the scripture. The authority for the scripture is the church. The fact is, it doesn't matter who wrote them, if the church accepted them and certified them, then they're authentic for us. And one of the great, perhaps, tragedies of the Protestant world when they were deconstructing Christianity, and it was a deconstruction, they tore it all apart, is the fact that they had no authority left. They denounced sacred tradition, they, they didn't, pay, didn't care about the Holy Fathers, and they didn't understand the meaning of, of the word ecclesia, of the word church. So they had no authority, nothing to base themselves on. So they turned the scripture into an idol, idol. and they have an idolatrous worship of the Bible without really understanding what it is, where it came from, what it's about. And the fact that it's not a book for the individual. You know, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scripture, Hebrews were not permitted to read the Scripture unless there was a minion present. There had to be ten people present, when, in ancient times, ten men present, before you could read the Scripture. And that was to prevent you from getting wild and woolly with it. Um, the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, was a book of the congregation of Israel. It wasn't a book of the individuals. <clears throat> and the Bible is not a book for the individual, except that you can draw inspiration from it. It's a book of the church. And it means exactly what the church says it means. And the church is the authority for its existence. Protestants seem to think that Mohammed's magic camel brought the, the New Testament fully typeset and bound from heaven. But there was a great deal of controversy that went into choosing which books should be in the New Testament and which ones should not. And it was the authority of the church that created the New Testament. It didn't fall fully bound or on, on a gigantic scroll from heaven. But the church gradually sorted out which books were authentic and began to use them. And uh, then finally they were put together in what we call the canon of scripture. And the biggest debates, as I recall, the biggest debates were about the book of Revelation, which the East didn't want to include, but Rome insisted. So the trade-off was the East would accept Hebrews, or the East would accept Revelation, but the West would accept Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. And that was kind of a trade-off. But in the, you'll notice uh, in the liturgical apostle book, the book of Revelation is not there. You'll notice that the book of Revelation is never read in church, and that any commentary on the book of Revelation, even from ancient times, is very speculative. So it, there are questions about it. Uh, it has certain passages in it that are Gnostic and that alerted the ancient church. Well, a little bit of questionable. You know, the idea that he's reserved so many men who have not defiled themselves with women is a Gnostic statement, not a Christian statement. Mm -hmm.
You know, giving birth to children does not defile a, a woman. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it puts her in contact with the divine. It makes her in contact with the heavenly. A participant in the ongoing creation of mankind by God. So that statement in it alone. And the final statement at the end of the book of Revelation, that anybody who changes even one word of this book is, you know, bell, book, and candle, and going to be tormented in hell and all. That's a typical Gnostic statement at the end of the book. Christian books never had something like that. And to compound that, uh, when they started combining this into a single volume, Protestants thought that that, child, that uh, word of condemnation referred to the entire Bible, but, it only, but when it was written, the book of Revelation, you didn't have a book that was called the Bible, you had individual scrolls or individual letters. So that book stood alone and it was talking only about itself. So we, uh, we approach those things with a little bit of caution, more caution than the West sometimes does. They're a little bit careless about these things. And since they don't know the history of these matters, uh, they, uh, they fall into an idolatry about the Bible. And we literally, we call it bibliolatry, that you worship the book rather than, than God. So if you try, can't worship God through the book, you can have regard for the book through worship. The liturgy is older than the New Testament, and many of the interpolations into the scripture come from the liturgy. But when you're accepting which book should be in the canon of scripture, you have to say which ones do not disagree with the liturgy, which ones do not contradict the apostolic traditions. And those are the ones we accept. So uh, really it doesn't matter who wrote them when the church has certified them. The church is the authority for the scripture. The scripture is not the authority for the church. And uh, that, that's what I wanted to say. And then to add something about, and perhaps it sheds a little bit of light on how we understand scripture. We have a liturgical service called Muscles. Or, uh, uh, came from the, in Greek, Eletheo, Eletheo, uh, yeah, a healing service. Now, you, you don't see it so much anymore, but in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and all the way back through into the 1800s, you used to see the Joshmo healing service. I mean, at one time there was um, a man named Leighton who had a healing service, and he would travel around the country, and he used to come to Vancouver to the old Blue Boy Motel ballroom and have a healing service. But it was always the me healing service, whatever the person's name was. It was never the Jesus Christ healing service. It was always the Joshua healing service or something. He was the message. Benny Hinn is the message, not the Holy Spirit. But when you have a Muslim, every priest can serve it equally and every congregation, so the priest can never be the message, the Holy Spirit is the message. And that's the thing about liturgical services. The priest isn't the message. It's never the message. You have, you know, Delegarum Crusade, you don't have the Jesus Christ Crusade. But in, in the, within the Orthodox Church, everyone is equal. So the Holy Spirit is the, the one who's working. The only message is the, the grace of the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the benefits of liturgical services. Now, to the uh, epistle for today, uh, 2 Corinthians, of course the Apostle Paul begins by again reiterating his authority to teach. Not his authority to, to lord it over the congregation, but his authority to teach. And then he's talking about Forgiving graciously. And that's what I wanted to look at a little bit today, to forgive graciously. I think uh, I already cited John Chrysostom and a couple of other fathers in this commentary on the, on the book, but I'll make it simple. Graciously is the word, not grace. 
But grace also works here. You know, uh, to, to, uh, grace is a free, unmerited gift. It means that we have to forgive each other people even if they don't deserve forgiveness by human standards. And now forgiving graciously is something that, uh, well actually husbands and wives don't always do it, but other people don't either. Uh, you know, the, the psalmist says he removes our iniquities as far as the east is from the west. Completely gone, they're completely vanished. Very often we offer our forgiveness to some people in an ungracious manner. Well, you're definitely wrong, but I'm going to forgive you anyway. You know, so we, we hold that in our minds. Or you can say you forgive someone in a way that actually humiliates them. Uh, that actually it cuts and causes more problems in the future. But forgiveness is uh, from, the, if, if we obey our Lord, forgive from the heart. We have to forgive from the heart. In other words, we have to purge to cleanse our heart. So forgiveness is two sides to it. It's what we offer to the other person. But it's also what we offer to our own heart. Because forgiveness of another person, a true forgiveness, involves the cleansing of our own heart from the grudges or malice that we hold because of the supposed offense. And the other part is trying to realize that offense doesn't come out of the blue most of the time. You had a part in whatever it was that offended you. And so you have to cleanse yourself first. You have to say, well, yeah, I had something to do with this problem too. So if you forgive the other person, uh, but forgiving also doesn't include continuing to have something to do with the other person. Sometimes it's beneficial to cut off your relationship with the other person because it's a constant trauma. And so you say, well, okay, I forgive the person. I'm not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to have malice. I'm going to cleanse my own heart to the best I can from feeling about the offense. But I'm not going to have anything to do with this person because they're going to keep leading me into you know, trouble. They're going to keep leading me into anger. They're going to keep leading me into wrath. And uh, there, there are any number of moral reasons why you wouldn't want to have something to do with another person. So uh, that, that doesn't hinder forgiveness. The fact that you don't want to continue your relationship with someone doesn't hinder forgiveness. But forgiveness really requires the cleansing of our own heart. Sincere forgiveness, forgiveness from the heart, gracious forgiveness. And it involves a forgiveness that never humiliates or accuses the other person. There's so many times when we say we forgive, but implicit in what we say is that we're accusing the person, but we'll forgive you anyway. If we're not forgiving them anyway. We're not forgiving them notwithstanding. We're just forgiving them. And the offense is removed as far as the east is from the west. This is part of purification of our own heart. Forgiveness is part of the purification of the heart. It's part of the prayer of the heart, in a way. To really make it meaningful and make it in a way which says uh, I'm at fault for taking offense if he took offense and supposing the other person is guilty supposing the other person is wrong sometimes it's more gracious to leave that as it stands you can't always say I'm right and you're wrong sometimes it's better to say uh, yeah, okay I'll accept that. And uh, even if you know that it's wrong, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make any difference. You just put it aside. And uh, I think husbands and wives are the worst people about this. They always hold something back, and they're going to use it later. 30, 30 years later. <laughs> yeah, when you get, yeah, uh, uh, 50 years later. It, uh, you know, I, I remember Bubba saying that, Bubba, I did a, my 
grandmother said about my grandfather. He says, we've been married for 60 years and he still comes up with some new trick I never saw before. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, uh, that's what happens. And uh, it, it, you know, there are uh, things about this that require a real effort. Forgiving is not always easy. You know, and love itself also it includes admiration for the other person. You have to admire the other person to really love them. And, uh, you know, you have to see qualities in them that even their, um, I should say, the, their irritating little habits <laughs> can end up being very endearing in the end. They can be part of why you love the person because of their irritating little habits, <laughs> you know. But when love is, it begins, usually it begins as a sexual love. But how many times in the last 50 years hearing confessions, I've seen sexual love turn to hate. Sexual love can very easily turn into a hatred. And the reason it can turn into a hatred is because you see somebody else you're sexually attracted to, but your spouse is in the way, in the way of your happiness. So then you build up, little by little in your heart, a hatred for that person who stands in your way, for your supposed happiness. And that's, uh, so love has to go a great deal deeper than that. And forgiveness between people who love each other should be almost automatic. And the, the thing is, you can forgive the other person without cleansing your heart. And it's not complete. You still have to cleanse your own heart of those feelings. And I, I remember years ago, a Serbian woman called me. She, she was going to get a divorce from her husband. She wanted a divorce. And she was at her parents' house with her kids. And uh, so she was talking to me on the phone about why she should marry this other person. He was an academic like she was, and her husband was a computer technician. And, you know, it was quite different, and she fell in love with this guy work. And uh, I said something about her children, and she said, well, what about my happiness? And before I could say anything, I heard her father in the background saying, to hell with your happiness, it has nothing to do with your happiness, it has to do with your children. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, in other words, to say, well, your happiness, what about the happiness of your children? What about the happiness of your husband? And that's the whole thing. That and I, I'm going to repeat a, a poem I often repeat, and, and these little things come up. And it's by actually one of my favorite poets, Edna C. Vincent Millay, and you've heard me say it before. Where she says, In the spring of the year, in the fall of the year, there is much that is fine to see and to hear in the fall of the year and the spring of the year. And it's not love's passing that spoils my days, but that it went in little ways. So little things mean a lot. And there's a build up over time. And that buildup over time can also be the cause of the fact that we outwardly forgive the person, but we don't cleanse our heart. That's the other part of forgiveness, cleaning our, cleansing our own hearts. And uh, that's, that's one of the great struggles that we have about being human. See, God's forgiveness occurs before we ever commit a sin. His forgiveness is always there. We just have to go back and take it. Just like the prodigal son, we have to just go back to the Father. He's already forgiven us. That's what the story is all about. And with Cain and Abel, when God comes down, he says nothing about punishment, nothing about damnation, nothing about condemnation. He wants Cain to confess, take his responsibility, and repent, because God doesn't want him pushed away. He doesn't want him punished. He's already accepted him back, but Cain won't. He doesn't cleanse his heart, he goes further away. So this is, the, this is one of the problems that we, uh, we, we have to struggle. That's why we talk about what we, I don't know what it is in Romanian, but struggle. You know, this thesis. And uh, it was to cleanse our hearts from these things that we don't often think about. 
You say, yeah, I forget those, but I forget, I forget the creed. <laughs> you know? And, uh, but we haven't cleansed our own hearts, we're still looking at it as a creed. <laughs> so we haven't cleansed our own hearts. That's a problem. We say, uh, but uh, we have to really look at that as well. So, uh, uh, you know, forgiveness can be sweet when it's done in love and when it's sincere. It can be a, a sort of a bitter yielding of the point when <laughs> we haven't given up the argument but pretend to forgive. That's, uh, so, any questions? This time. Well, the, <clears throat> after forgiveness, in the relationship with a person, mm -hmm. uh, if you continue to have the relation, relations with that person, I'm not going to go with your immediate family, but friends, let's say, yeah. just as an example. If you carry on visiting them, with them, if you truly forget, forgave them from your heart, the relationship can carry on. Because you, you, you pretty much like, you dis the, everything that happened in the past disappeared all of a sudden. It's almost like you don't remember about it. But if you don't yeah. forgive from your heart, yeah. it's always going to be in front of you. As soon as you, if, as soon as you see that person, in your mind, it, it comes up right away, the fact that, oh, I had a, an argument with that person. And well, if you have an argument with every time you see them, it's probably best for both of you, and both of your spiritual lives, if you don't see each other anymore. Mm -hmm. But is that what I mean, it's kind of a, it's like saying don't judge. And we don't want to judge, but if our children are playing with some kids and we find out those kids are, are doing dope, what are we going to do? There's some, there's certain kind of a judgment you have to pass here, and the judgment is, it's not good for my kids to play with them anymore, because they might get hooked on drugs. See? My, uh, my foster sister, they had adopted children, they couldn't have children, and uh, they let their little girl go and do a, do a sleepover at a friend's house. And when the daughter came back, she was using foul language that she'd never heard in the home. And she said, where did you get that, those words from? Up, up on the television. It turned out that the parents, together with their children, watch pornographic videos. Mm, wow. Now, I don't know what they want to call it, a judgment or an assessment, but <laughs> uh, my sister decided that it wasn't a good idea for her child to be over there anymore. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, uh, that, that, so that's, that's where you have this sort of conflict of ideas. There are times when we have to make a judgment of kinds, but that really isn't what is being spoken of when it says judge not lest you be also judged. You know, we, we're so prone to sit in judgment of other people, and we usually judge and condemn other people so we'll feel better about ourselves. That's the primary reason. <clears throat> and uh, often, it, it's, this stuff comes out of envy. We set moral standards sometimes because we envy the person who's doing something that we can't do. So we make what he's doing immoral. Not on any other real basis, not on any other real foundation, but because we envy the person who's doing those things that we can't do. And so we become moralists. Instead of moral, we become moralists. We're judging that person. But so much of the time, so much of the judgment that we pass toward another person, the judgment is not whether they're right or wrong, but how much envy we have inside. We envy that person, therefore we judge them as wrong, so we can feel better about ourselves. And so much of the judgments that we make in this life against other people are based on envy or based on a desire to make ourselves feel better than we actually are. So Paul tells us not to uh, exalt ourselves beyond, beyond ourselves. That, uh, whatever translation of it you use, but don't, uh, don't believe more of yourself than is, re than is true. Don't try to exalt yourself more. We're all in the same boat together. <laughs> but uh, uh, just stop and think sometime when you judge somebody, stop and think within yourself very deeply. Am I judging them because I'm envious of them? 
you know, it's so common to say, well, you know, I don't, uh, I don't envy those rich people because uh, they're really not very happy anyway. How do you know if they're happy or not? You're just envious because they're rich and you're not. So you want to make their life look more miserable so you don't feel so bad about yourself. Now, Uncle Michael told, uh, on, the, on the other side of that, uh, Uncle Michael, when he came to, uh, Chinese-Russian, when he came to uh, North America, finally he came to British Columbia, since he spoke five languages quite fluently, somebody suggested to him, he was, you know, flat broke in money, mm -hmm. and uh, said, well, you speak all these languages, why don't you tutor language, some of the better homes, and in those days it was Shaughnessy, uh, some of these well, your homes, they'll pay you to come in and teach language. So he can be a personal tutor, he'd go into their homes and teach them. And afterwards he says, you know, I, I've been in my mind never, no matter how much money I make, I'm going to put it in a trust for a charity because I'm not going to be rich. Because I never saw such misery and unhappiness as I did in the wealthiest homes in Vancouver. <laughs> <laughs> so there is that too, you know, that language. <laughs> But very often we judge because we want to feel better about ourselves than it's out of envy. Most of the judgments we pass on other people stem from a dark place in our own hearts. And we need to shine light into that dark place in order to put ourselves, ourselves right. So uh, that's uh, judgments out of envy. You know, even if somebody's doing something that technically we don't uh, consider moral, we have to still refrain ourselves from judging because we don't know what's in the other person's heart or conscience or mind. We don't know what the other person's situation is. And I say this often about, I say, often I say this about prostitutes and why I think prostitution should be legalized because a good many of those women are on the street not because they decided to be immoral, uh, but for other reasons that we need to know. And we need to clean up those reasons if we're going to take people off the street. We need to know why they're there and what we can do to heal the reasons. Not just to say, it's immoral and we're going to put them in jail. No. Let's say, why are they there and what can we do to make the circumstances that put them there go away? Our first duty, our first moral obligation is the safety of those women. That's our first moral obligation. So if we legalize and get rid of the pimps, they're a lot safer. See? But our real moral obligation is to find out what circumstances put them on the street in the first place and how do we make those circumstances go away so that they can be liberated. That's the part we don't think about. We just think about making a moral judgment. Then, but for the grace of God, go I. Or, hate the sin, but love the sinner. I mean, those are such tacky, nauseating statements. <laughs> and they're certainly not moral statements. They're statements of condescension and arrogance. And uh, so we're, we're looking down on people. You know. So we have to be careful about that, too. I want to ask you something, because we've been in a, such a difficult situation. Um, we met, I had a patient, I work in a physio clinic, yeah. so I had a patient, she was very sweet, very nice, I helped her as much as I could, she got better, and then she invited me to her wedding. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, see, one thing, she is lesbian, so she was inviting me to a lesbian wedding, yeah. which, as much as I didn't want to judge, I couldn't go, mm -hmm. so she got upset. Yeah. Well, that's, that's I sort apologize, of but I didn't promise I would yeah. go. Uh, my husband was even more okay. apprehensive about that. Well, this is a no, mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. We don't. We're not going to celebrate their thing. Oh, but that's not the Orthodox Church, don't know. <laughs> so, so they got <laughs> upset. <laughs> they got uh, upset with that, and yeah. Somebody, uh, somebody asked me once, as a. I don't think I got forgiveness. Would you accept, somebody asked me if I accept gay weddings. I said, I don't accept Protestant weddings, let alone gay weddings. <laughs> and if two Protestants come, become Orthodox and come to me, 
I want them to have their marriage blessed in the church. I don't accept their wedding. Two people are married by the justice of the peace. As far as I'm concerned, they're not even married. The justice of the peace Why? is a symbol that they can't sanctify. If a justice of the peace could sanctify, what do we need us for? Well, yeah. that was so that, that, that's the whole thing is take the whole picture here. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't have seen you about whose weddings I don't accept. I don't accept any weddings outside the church. Sure. No marriage is, sure, is really valid. It's outside the Orthodox Church. None of them. So what difference does it make whether I go to this one or that one? Because, uh, I, I mean, so being you know, I went, I, I, went, I, I went one time because it was somebody's family that was close to me. I went to a Roman Catholic wedding one time. And I never got to another one. Because all, all that happened is the couple, you know, the, bride, the bride's father owns her, so he gives her away because he owns her. She doesn't have a person of her own. So her father owns her until he gives her to the groom. And then uh, they, they walk up to the high altar, and the whole service consisted in the reading of one psalm, and the couple lighted candles to the spirits of their dead ancestors, which were supposedly present in the marriage. Some kind of necromancy, you know. And uh, I said, you know, that's, I'd never go through that again. I wouldn't want to go through it. You know, you think of the difference that how in the Orthodox Church we bless them in the name of all the Old Testament prophetic couples. Because marriage is prophecy and revelation. But it's taken, you know, in the West, marriage is just a license to have sex. If you don't have that piece of paper, it's not to have sex. If you do have that piece of paper, it's okay. That's, it just boils down to that. In the Orthodox Church, this is a sanctification of a, a, a type of prophecy and revelation in the Church. It's a sanctification of, of the understanding of Christ in the Church and the understanding of the nature of creation. So if you didn't want to go to their wedding, fine. Uh, you know, uh, I know some people who wouldn't go to a, a <laughs> Jewish wedding either because of Jewish. But anyway, uh, it make any but, thing, but the thing is yeah. not to be judgmental about the people because you don't know what the circumstances are. And and I would never participate in a same-sex marriage, but I would never condemn one because I know that gay people have no choice and their condition in life. Yeah. They're born with that. Now there are a lot of people, ideologically, yeah. they'll deny that. But they can't deny it in reality because science is, is against them. Yeah. You know. And this is perhaps one of the tragedies of, of especially North American Christianity, evangelicalism. Why young people become atheists or agnostics? Because they're lied to so much in church. They're lied to by their pastors. They're lied to by the people who are giving sermons. They're lied to by the leaders of their church. They're lied to by bishops. They're lied to by priests. And they know they're being lied to. That's about so many things. So many things. Not just that. Even about the creation of the universe, which is a typology. Not a, I, won't, I won't explain that too much now, but it's a typology. It's not... Yeah. A literal historical fact. In fact, I'm writing a little paper on types and symbols in the Orthodox Church now. That's why the what we call the cred, credulity, the creed, is the actual word for the symbol of faith. So the symbol and type has a very specific meaning in the Orthodox world. So they, they don't acknowledge this in marriage. How can uh, how can the father give the bride away when he doesn't own her? Because in the ancient world, she didn't have a personhood. She was a human being only because she belonged to a man. Only because she was a man's property. So she was given to the husband, literally, as his property. And that's still, that's still the case in, in Islam. A woman is nothing. She's only identified by the man she belongs to, the man who owns her. She doesn't have an individual personhood. So I would never tolerate the father giving the bride away because he doesn't own her. She's not his property to give away. In fact, the betrothal 
The only question that's ever asked back there is, are you here of your own free will or did somebody compel you to come here? That's a question that's asked. You know, in the old country they asked that question. Because the bride was often sold to the man. Sold like a cow or a piece of property. Yeah, that's, that's the thing. So when we talk about is this marriage or that marriage, what I call it, this marriage or that marriage, I, I don't accept Protestant marriages. Why should I accept a, a, another marriage that's outside of tradition? So if you if you're close enough friends to go, go. If you're conscious, no, if you don't go, don't go. But uh, they'll leave them to themselves. Yeah. So uh, thank you. You know, that's oh, all I can say. <laughs> yeah. uh, so anything else? Yeah. No. We are glad to see you. That you mm. give us. Mm. We are glad to be here with you. Oh, well, we're happy. To anyway, see I hope you pick up something. We'll, we'll go on with uh, uh, Second Corinthians a little bit later. I have some things from Saint John Chrysostom I want to bring into it. I was just thinking about. So when you forgive, but then how do you cleanse your heart? Well, that's another story. You know, the yes. Russians have a saying: "I'll forgive." But I'll never forget. Yeah, so, <laughs> it's easier said than done. <laughs> you know, and actually you have to pray about it and really contemplate. We think. Thinking is very rare. Contemplation is very rare. But yet there are essential aspects of the Orthodox Christian spiritual life. That to sit and think about things and to contemplate them. And to pray about them. We, we have to try to somehow assess our own motives. Because our motives are as important as our actions. Our, motive, our, our motives for those actions are important as well. So we have to sit and really think very deeply about what our motives are. You know, sometimes we, uh, it's our own frustrations, our own weariness with life, our own unfulfilled desires about life that cause us to hold grudges against people and not forgive. And we have to think about whether that's the case or not. So uh, that's that all too often the case, that our own frustrations are the source of our anger. That, so, I mean, when you get to be my age, of so many unfulfilled things that don't can't recount them anymore, so they don't give you trouble anymore. <laughs> you're just, you're just, just happy you quit when you can put your own shoes on. <laughs> Which I've only been able to do for a week now. Oh, so, my own shoes on. Oh. so uh, you know, little by little, I guess. It, it, uh, when I was home the first couple of months, I couldn't dress myself completely, and. Uh, in the hospital, they taught us how to put our trousers on in bed by doing something called bridging. And it was really quite an ordeal. But then when I got to the point where I could just sit on the edge of my bed and put my trousers and my shirt and my socks on, well, not my uh, compression socks, I mean, the regular socks. And then, uh, so for a, over a week now, I've been able to put my own shoes on. <laughs> so that, that's the sort of thing that, you know, much more than my old dreams of grandeur and glory, being able to put my own shoes on, filled me with some kind of sense of accomplishment. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, anyway, okay, that's it. Thank you so much.